Welcome to Direction Northeast. Hello, I'm Mike Wells. This program is a presentation of the Mass Communications Department of Northeast State Community College. His studies take jazz lovers from bebop to hip hop. His life is music and he uses it as a means to confront racism. His name is Pierce Freelon. With him is his producer, Stephen Levitton, also known as Apple Juice Kid, and we'll meet them right after this. What if there was a place where your mind is nourished, your time respected, a place where you don't feel lost in the crowd, where you get the attention you need and deserve? What if that place is right here, right here, right here, all along, over 80 programs of study, a main campus, and convenient teaching sites, unlimited potential, right in your backyard, Northeast State, Northeast State, Northeast State Community College. His mother is Grammy nominee Nina Freelon. He's a professor, journalist, and musician. He is the founder and CEO of the Black Academics, and he developed a hip-hop curriculum for high school and the university students, which has been implemented in Los Angeles, Atlanta, and Ghana. Welcome to Direction Northeast, Pierce Freelon. Hey, thank you. Doing, you. Pierce? I'm doing good. How are you? Good. How are you? And how are you, Stephen? I'm great. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, question is for you. Pierce, uh, how did you come up with the concept of the Beat Lab? Uh, well, the Beat Making Lab uh, actually was founded by Apple Juice Kid and our, uh, well, at the time he wasn't our department head, but our current department head in the music department at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, a guy named Mark Katz. Um, I, they, they founded the class in uh, fall 2011 semester, and Stephen invited me to uh, co-teach the class in, in January, so I mean, I would I would really direct that question back to Stephen, like the idea for the foundation of it. Yeah, so I'm a producer, a beat maker professionally. It's what I do uh, for a living, and I'm also a graduate of UNC Chapel Hill. So I approached the university about um, doing a class on modern music production. I really felt like in a traditional music department of jazz and classical music, there needed to be something that um, addressed the needs of you know, current producers. So uh, Mark Katz and I initially developed the lab, then Pierce came along and uh, took the lab to wonderful new directions. Did you, did you face any criticism when you started the Beat Lab? Uh, we didn't face, well, Mark Katz probably faced criticism from his colleagues. I didn't see any of it directly. I just saw um, people curious if students were gonna wanna take this. And I was overly confident that it would be too many students wanting to take this, which is the case. There's, there's a lot of students who want to take this class. Yeah, the, the, word, the word I would use is, isn't criticism, it's enthusiasm. Did you face enthusiasm when <laughs> starting the class? The answer yeah. is yes. Criticism, no. Enthusiasm, yes. <laughs> uh, Stephen, how do you use it in your classes? How do I use? The Beat Lab. The Beat Lab. Um, well, the beat making lab uh, has three components. The practical beat making part, which is how to use the software and uh, program drums, chop samples. The other part is entrepreneurship, how to make a living as a beat maker. So whether it's selling beats to artists or licensing your music on TV and film, lots of avenues of entrepreneurship around your own projects, creating your own um, avenues. And the third part is the history, a, um, a version of the history of beat making. Uh, Pierce, how has uh, how do you feel the art has the power to change people? Uh, art is uh, is a very powerful medium for human expression. I think um, you know if you if you look back, uh, you know at human civilizations all over the world, um, you know there's there's some form of musical expression, whether it's dance or music, um, you know. It's just an important part of our experience and interaction as, uh, as human beings. So uh, naturally, in, in whatever we're engaged in, um, you know, whether it's uh, something community-oriented or something about you know, expressing your spirituality or if it's uh, you know, an expression of uh, you know, grief and grieving at a, at a uh, you know, a funeral or a, uh, you know, a death ceremony, and, and a, I'm talking about just culturally, interculturally, art just finds a way of, of easing into our most important 
you know, human interaction. So I think it's just, it's just, you know, it's as fundamental as, as language and love. It's just art. It's just one of those really important things. So tapping into the power of that is a really, is a really cool. It's a privilege, I think, to be able to teach art and to teach beat making, to teach emceeing, um, to be able to teach these things. It's just you know, a wonderful opportunity. Uh, Stephen, how has the transition from teaching uh, hip hop on a historical level uh, to hands on? Well, I'm going to let Pierce answer that because Pierce actually teaches class um, on the history of hip hop, and he he has made a great transition to the hands on part. So in our class, he, he handles that part. Yeah, yeah. So um, I've taught uh, classes, uh, you know, on intro to jazz, intro to hip hop. I've taught, you know, blacks and popular culture. I'm currently this semester in the African Studies Department at UNC teaching a class on African cultural production and politics. So, um, you know, the, the talking about the, the history and the background is cool because uh, I basically, when I'm developing a curriculum and writing a syllabus, I think about who my biggest inspirations are. And I'm like, okay, you know, Bob Marley, Lauren Hill, Fela Kuti, Nina Simone. And uh, basically my job in, in many of these classes is to introduce these uh, artists to my students and uh, put them in their uh, appropriate historical, cultural context. Um, so that is, uh, you know, it's, it's really an amazing opportunity. One, I get to put my students onto some new stuff that perhaps they weren't aware of, um, or contextualize artists that maybe they already knew about in a new light. Uh, whereas with the beat making lab, uh, while we do a, a third of the curriculum is a history of beat making, um, we're also nurturing practitioners. So uh, when we go and we listen to the beats of a Dr. Dre or the Neptunes or um, you know, any, any of these great producers or Apple Juice Kid, um, the next step is them for them to sit in the producer chair themselves and to, and to produce uh, music themselves. So it's, it's a really big transition, a really big shift, and uh, I enjoy both a lot. But um, it's certainly nice, I I'll say, at the end of the semester, Grading a paper is one thing. You know, it's something that, that I've, I've had to do since I started teaching. Listening to an album as their final project is completely different. And I really enjoy that aspect of teaching Beat Making Lab is that their final project is the music. And so uh, I'm still bumping last semester's final project. We had them uh, create an album sampling North Carolinian artists. And so that's just it's a really cool, uh, a really cool shift from a uh, kind of the historical to the practical. Uh, Stephen, can you tell me how laptops are considered or instruments? Great question. Um, so on a laptop, you have uh, programs that simulate uh, analog instruments. And you also have uh, programs on laptops that have completely redefined what music creation is that has nothing to do with the analog counterpart. So um, it works in both levels. Some, you know, you don't need that big keyboard and the rack of amps. You can just, you know, have the virtual ones. And then other instruments, um, certain drum machines, uh, loop, uh, loop machines will allow you to do things you probably couldn't do on an analog counterpart. So, you know, the ability to run around the laptop and create a piece of music is completely um, a viable instrument to learn. Pierce, did you ever imagine your hip hop curriculum becoming implemented in several schools around the United States? Um, I think, uh, yeah, actually. I think hip hop is something that resonates with young people. It's a youth movement and a youth culture. It was, it was founded by people who were like 16, 17 years old, you know, initially uh, in the Bronx and then just spread out of New York and is this huge international phenomenon and everywhere we go uh, you know we were recently in the Congo uh, we both done work in uh, in East Af in uh, West Africa and Ghana um, I've done hip-hop workshops in Vietnam and India and everywhere there's always an, a young MC who wants to spit me their verse in in Swahili or French or uh, you know uh, whatever their whatever their native language is and um, you know, there's always you know people that want to come up and break dance and express themselves uh, through hip hop culture. Um, 
So it, it didn't surprise me at all. I mean, the first hip hop workshop curriculum that I did was at Durham School of the Arts, and I was born in Durham, North Carolina. So this was my alma mater, my, the middle school that I went to. And um, yeah, immediately uh, kind of took on a life of its own, and I was doing workshops across the country and internationally. And um, yeah, I think it, it's just, it resonates with people uh, at a really intimate level. So I'm not surprised at all that it's, that it's had a, you know, success in, in impl international implementation. How does uh, hip hop differ from the rock and roll? Uh, well, hip hop and rock and roll are two uh, branches of the same tree. I think um, really they both emerge out of like the blues, a uh, blues tradition. Um, if, you, if you look at like elements of American music um, that, that make cultural products from this country unique, uh, things like uh, syncopated rhythms, improvisation, kind of like a blues uh, pentatonic scale with a lot of the music. Um, you know, all this stuff, um, you know, it wasn't created in the United States, but it was certainly revolutionized uh, here in the U.S. So, you know, uh, there are a lot of hip hop records that sample a lot of, uh, a lot of classic uh, rock and, and, uh, and blues records. So, you know, I think, um, you know, yeah, if, if, you look at, if you look at American music as a tree, I think uh, spirituals are the roots of that tree. Um, the, the main trunk is, is built of jazz and blues. Those are the two kind of main uh, elements of American music. And from there, you have, you have uh, gospel, you have country, you have rock and roll, you have hip hop. And, and again, they all kind of share a foundation at a very basic level with uh, the elements that came before them. Uh, how do you feel the power of redemption uh, songs have changed America? Power of Redemption songs? Uh, that's, a, that's a good question. Well, that, that, dep that depends on what you mean by redemption songs. I think I have a workshop called Redemption Songs, which is inspired by um, Bob Marley's song, Redemption Songs. And I think, uh, I think music can be a very uh, redemptive, expressive uh, vessel. You know, like song can be a, a really a really amazing and transformative, uh, and music in general can be a transformative thing. Um, you know, and again, it's a cross genre. It's not just hip hop. Um, you know, there, there, there's, there's, we're here in Tennessee. You know, Nashville's right around the corner. So there's a, there's a lot of uh, redemptive aspects to, to country music and the gospel and a lot of different music. Not all music is, is uh, you know, redemptive, if you, wanna, if you wanna put it that way, or conscious or, um, social impact music. Sometimes music is just for entertainment. If you want to dance, you want to relax, or you want to escape. Um, there are a lot of uh, important roles that music plays, I think, in our lives. And, uh, and a redemptive role is, is one of the very important ones. Uh, Pierce, one of your endeavors, uh, Black Academics, explores uh, race and identity, music and culture. What are your conclusions about today's black culture? Uh, black culture is everywhere. Uh, I mean, hip hop is a black culture. It was born, again, in the Bronx, New York, by black and Puerto Rican teenagers. Like, it's important to kind of contextualize that, that this whole cultural movement, and there are several elements in the movement. There's, uh, there's emceeing, so rapping and beat making. There's uh, DJing, which is a, a cultural innovation that simply did not exist before uh, it was created by um, uh, hip hop artists in the Bronx, New York. And I mean, DJing is in turning turntables, which are devices used for playing music, turning that into an instrument of scratching and DJing. There's also uh, graffiti and break dancing. Um, these, are, these are elements of black culture that have uh, you know, inspired the world. Um, and I think it's, it's thriving, it's alive and well. Uh, there's an aspect of black culture that I think is uh, is being exploited uh, in a way that is not uh, very redeeming or flattering. You know, I think uh, in America we have a long tradition, starting with minstrelsy, of black culture being exploited through stereotype and you know, kind of negative imagery. And I think that continues today. Um, a really good example of that. I mean, I'm not going to cliche say gangster rap. Um, because I think gangster rap is something very specific coming out of the West Coast that was, you know, prominent from like 1989 to, to the early 90s. So I won't, uh, I don't want to call it gangster rap, but I'll say um, like a lot of mainstream hip hop 
is very reinforces a lot of negative stereotypes and and so I I do think uh, and but you know not just hip hop there's there's film and there's a lot of different aspects of American popular culture that I think exploits uh, images of of people of color not just black people um, but uh, but I think overall uh, culturally um, black culture which is American culture is innovative and inspiring and cutting edge and uh, we're always kind of looking looking to our culture for trends for what the new it thing is and that's uh, you know that's that's cool I think that's one of the cool aspects of our culture uh, Stephen can can uh, beat music be made out of any instrument um, Scroll in my brain for every instrument there is on the planet, <laughs> um, I would have to say yes, <laughs> that it can be made out of any instrument. Um, I think that's the beauty of um, beat making as an art form, is that it has no rules of what is an appropriate sample. Everything is appropriate. Everything um, is, is up for fair game. And the more bizarre, the more outlandish, the better the music will probably be. Uh, Pierce, who are some of the major influences in your life? In my life? Um, wow, well I named a lot of them. Uh, basically, when, <laughs> when I'm teaching like a popular music class or just a, you know, uh, music and politics class, I basically like look at my ideal playlist and I put them all in the syllabus. Um, so I mentioned a few, uh, three North Carolinians, uh, I'll mention Nina Simone, Thelonious Monk, John Coltrane. They're uh, jazz musicians that uh, I draw a little, a lot of inspiration from. I'm in a, a hip hop and jazz quartet called The Beast. And um, you know, we're very influenced by like bebop, jazz, and, and you have their uh, kind of three pioneers that, that kind of dwelled in that realm and also happen to be North Carolina natives, which is awesome. Uh, on the hip hop side, um, uh, there's a new artist <coughs> that um, just released a debut album named Kendrick Lamar, who I think is a phenomenal MC uh, from uh, the West Coast. Uh, speaking of uh, speaking of West Coast rappers, um, there's a North Carolina native named Fonte, who I just think is one of my top five rappers. <coughs> my one of my favorite MCs. My number one favorite MC is Nas, who um, you know is from Queens, New York. And uh, you know, I, I love his consciousness. I love uh, the brilliance of his lyrical delivery and his wordplay. Um, so those are some of my, uh, you know, jazz and hip hop. When I'm, uh, like I said, in the beast, those are the two main genres that we work from. Um, but uh, I'm increasingly getting put on to a lot of electronic music. Uh, Apple Juice Kid, is, I think, is a wonderful producer and, and musician. And um, yeah, I, these days I listen to a lot more. Um, I'll put local local music in quotes. Um, I'm a lot more interested in what's happening on the fringes than uh, what's happening as much uh, kind of in in popular music. I think I think pop music is like a moment in time, and and there are other kind of musical influences that fly under the radar where where you see the innovation and kind of different stuff happening. Uh, we always encourage our beat students to think outside the box. So. I think the number one criteria for being an inspiring force to me is just somebody who just wildly is outside of the box, like doing something completely different, uh, which kind of makes you like look at the genre a little bit differently and you know think about your craft a little differently. Uh, what role does gangster rap play in uh, the beat making? In beat making? Uh, that's a good question. Um, Gangster rap, like I said, I think it's it's probably an overused term. Um, you know, you, you can't just say gangster rap uh, in a vacuum. Gangster rap, like, kind of rose to prominence uh, with bands like uh, N.W.A., um, you know, Snoop Dogg, like West Coast, Dr. Dre, Snoop Dogg, Death Row Records. You know, that was kind of a uh, a uh, um, 90s phenomenon which uh, and you know people look at artists that you know talk about drug dealing and pimping and illegal activities as uh, gangster rappers but by the time you get to people like 50 cent for example <clears throat> you've kind of you're not really talking about gangster rap you're talking about pop music you know 50 cents album get rich or die trying which is all about gang banging was a diamond record that means sold over 10 million copies of the record 
And so it, it's not really like a subgenre of hip hop anymore, a subgenre of rap. It's just it's pop music. And um, even today, uh, you can you can see some you know you're at a basketball game or in a Disney movie, and you'll hear like the beat for um, what was that uh, Fifty Cent song? In the club. In the club. Yeah. You know, it's just it's completely crossed over, despite the fact that he's rapping about all this, you know, uh, terrible stuff. Um, so anyway, uh, and not not terrible artistically, but just terrible for like to be in some kids movie. You know what I mean? Um, so anyway, um, I think, uh, so if you're talking about popular rap music where the artists kind of focus on illegal, illegal activities in their lyrics, I think it plays a very big influence in beat making because uh, when you come into a classroom like the Beat Making Lab and, and you ask what kind of hip hop artists or producers that the students are familiar with, <clears throat> the majority of them will be like, oh, you know, Rick Ross, Lil Wayne, 50 Cent, you know, they're gonna name the most popular hip hop artist. And uh, many of those artists, um, uh, many of those artists kind of rap about the same five or six subjects. It's like, you know, women, wealth, uh, drugs, um, you know, just kind of the very, very narrow scope in terms of songwriting. Uh, and a lot of times the production will be really out, or really diverse, really interesting but those are the artists that they can name. Um, I'll give you a really good example as it relates to beat making, trap music. There's a, there's a type of music called trap music. And uh, from a production standpoint, it basically one of the defining elements of a trap beat is a really fast hi-hat, like so fast that it almost sounds like a cicada, like, brrr, like really fast hi-hat. What are some uh, big trap producers? Lex Luger Le invented like the whole new trap movement, yeah. The trap movement, right. So trap. Trap, the trap movement, what a trap is, is a slang term for a dangerous neighborhood. Uh, it's, it's a term that came out of Atlanta. People like T.I. and, um, uh, uh, well, T.I. is just a really good example. Uh, T-Pain. Not everyone has a T in their name. Those are just the only two I can think <laughs> of. Uh, but, you know, trap music kind of emerged out of this kind of, uh, kind of this gangster. Gucci man. Gucci man. Yeah, it's like a gangster southern culture. And uh, you know, again, trap is a direct reference to like a dangerous neighborhood where drug dealing and all this other stuff goes on. But there's also a type of production that people identify as trap music. But then it, it, it also takes other directions. There are EDM, electronic dance music producers that are doing like trap remixes of Justin Bieber songs and pop music. You know, so, so I, think, uh, I think what initially may start as something that is like a lyrical kind of cultural underground reference in hip hop uh, can translate um, to the production styles. And then, uh, you know, so a lot of our students come in, they want to do the crazy fast hi-hat, because that's the, that's the great beat they heard Rick Ross rhyming over on the radio, and they want to emulate the Lex Luger beat. So, um, I mean, it, you know, that's just kind of one example of how, of how the lyrics of the rappers can influence the, um, the production styles. It's just the more popular it is, the more people will be into it. The more people are into it, the more places you'll see it kind of manifesting. Uh, you mentioned trap. Uh, can you compare that to dubstep? Uh, yeah, so dubstep is a genre that um, actually has a very similar BPM. BPM is like the tempo of the track. So um, the people that invented dubstep, which I actually met them out of England, um, <coughs> they use a program called Fruity Loops. It just happened to be on 140, that particular tempo and they didn't realize they could change the tempo. So that's why dubstep has this like kind of slow, you know, 140 is a really unusual tempo. Usually it's either house music or like hip hop. But dubstep is, you know, so um, it was really a tempo thing. And then obviously the wobble bass lines <coughs> came about that. Now trap music, um, people usually consider 70 the tempo, which is half of 140. So it's actually very similar to dubstep in the tempo arena. Um, and trap is also on uh, the forefront of the newest like wave of EDM music, which you know borrowed from hip hop and now it's this huge in EDM, um, just how dubstep is huge. Uh, Pierce, how, how did you get involved in, with the nonprofit organization, Yole Africa? Yole Africa, oh, okay, so Yole, <clears throat> was founded by a guy named Petna Ndaliko. His wife 
Ashri and Deliko was recently hired by the music department where we teach, the beat making lab. So uh, she was coming in to the faculty at UNC and was interested in, in integrating a music program into uh, Yole Africa, which is a cultural center in Goma, Democratic Republic of Congo. So, um, you know, they already did a great dance program, they had a film program, they had a music program, but they didn't have a beat making program. So Apple Juice and I had already been talking about um, building a community lab, and it was, uh, we were initially intended to build the lab in a local North Carolina community, maybe in Durham or Chapel Hill. But when Cherie came across uh, with this idea for an international lab, we were like, hey, we could totally build a beat lab in Congo. So we kind of just uh, met with her, brainstormed with her, and with Mark Katz, our department chair. And uh, by the end of our meeting, we were just determined to raise the money to make it happen in Congo. Uh, Stephen, can you explain uh, Kickstarter and how important crowdsourcing is? Yes, um, Kickstarter is probably the premier crowdsourcing uh, website platform out there. So by crowdsourcing means <coughs> someone has an idea, an artist or entrepreneur, a person, they put the idea out on a website and then they get their community, their friends, their family and even people beyond that to source, you know, source the money from them and then that funds the goal. So we actually used uh, an alternative called Indiegogo and that's how, you know, when we uh, decided yes, we're gonna go to the Congo, we said yes to everyone. And then the reality sets in like, oh, how do we get that money? So now, you know, five years ago you would have never thought when I mean, Kickstarter Indiegogo didn't exist, you probably just, you know, you ask, you couldn't really appropriately ask people. It was an awkward situation. With uh, Indiegogo, it was not an awkward situation. We had, we made a video, we wrote out um, a plan, and we m sent that link to our friends and family, and they had the option to give $1 up to $5,000, and each of those increments had a certain um, uh, reward. So like for $25, you'd get a t-shirt. For $500, you'd get the original artwork from the album. So um, it's just a great, fun way to raise money for whatever crazy idea you have. Like, let's go to the Congo and make a beat making lab. <laughs> so. Well, guys, we thank you for joining us today. Thank you. We'll be right back in just a moment to wrap up Direction Northeast. Business, medical, and financial institutions must have confidence in the data that they use. Information assurance is the strategic use of technology and software to protect data from internal and external threats. Northeast State offers an associate's degree program designed to fill the demand for information assurance professionals. The information assurance program offers hands-on personal instruction. Northeast State Community College is an accredited institution offering financial aid and job placement. Northeast State, we're here to get you there. That concludes the program for today. We learned about the power of music and the changing world of our guests, Pierce Freelon and Apple Juice Kids. Community is very important to the students at Northeast State Community College, and this program takes a look at a few of the subjects they find important. Until we meet next time, on the behalf of the students, staff, and faculty of Northeast State Community College, I'm Mike Wells, and this is Direction Northeast.